This is Cup of Go for Friday, June 16, 2023. Keep up to date with the important happenings in the Go community in 15 minutes per week. I'm Jonathan Hall. And I'm Shai Nechmad. This episode is sponsored by Koyeb, developer-friendly serverless platform for deploying your apps globally. Stick around for more information about them later in the show. It's not just an episode sponsored. It's the 20th episode. Yay, episode number 20. It's. I really wanted to celebrate a uh, uh, two to the power number. Okay. But we forgot to do it in the yeah. previous thing. So we have to celebrate some milestone. We didn't do yeah. 10. We didn't do five. So let's do 20. We'll do 20. Because we're talking about Go 120 today. Yay. All right. So on our latest episode, we mentioned that Go 120.5 was about to release. And we didn't know what the issues were. Uh, and now, obviously, it is uh, released. It was released just a few hours after the episode came out, just our luck. Um, and you can go check out the issues. It's mostly CVs and some documentation stuff. So if you're interested in uh, the security of the Go project, go read that. I didn't find anything that's particularly interesting. Um, also, if talking about housekeeping releases, you should probably upgrade to even if you don't care about it. If you use VS Code, uh, then VS Code Go released with a few bug fixes in there as well. To me, it was surprising because I've been using Go in VS Code, like VS Code is my main ID. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been using it to develop Go, and I have had zero issues. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I guess some people have. You know, maybe they use Linux. You know what I mean, Jonathan? Hey, now I use Linux. I don't have problems with that. I have problems with other things, like my disk filling up, but not uh, <laughs> not VS Code. <laughs> uh, so two uh, releases that are more uh, clean up than anything else. Remember to upgrade. What has been going on in the community? Wow, we had a lot happen. Of course, it's been a week and a half since we did the last episode, since the schedule change. Um, so there's been a lot more opportunity for things. But I think probably the biggest thing that happened is a new discussion, hopefully leading to a proposal. I, I say hopefully, probably leading to a proposal about a new standard library package, or rather a new version of a standard library package. So Russ Cox, four days ago, uh, published a discussion on GitHub, link in the description, uh, about creating a Math Rand V2 package in the center library this will be the first v2 in our center library why would they change math you remember that? yeah i mean math is kind of universal right math is um, math why would they change math <laughs> math is math so math crazy, is math I, I think that the old version just wasn't random enough and you wanted a more random interface to this uh, this api uh no <laughs> maybe the reverse hey now. of that <laughs> hey now <laughs> It's a long discussion. I'm not going to talk about all the points, but he actually goes through 11 points that he wants to uh, to change about how to, to make the API more consistent with the CryptoRand interface, uh, how to make it just more intuitive, changing the names of some functions. Uh, have you ever used the rat, math rand uh, library and seen the int 31 and int 31 in and go, what the heck? What's this 31? I, uh, these int 32s and int, you know stuff like that. So I, I love the quote there. He says, these names are unnecessarily pedantic and confusing. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so that's one of the things that, that's being proposed to change. And several other things. Like I said, there's 11 points here. I think it's it's probably a good change. I, I haven't taken the time to digest the details of all 11 points, but the ones that I just jumped out at me as making sense all made sense. So I, I think it's a good proposal. I think that the main uh, issue is not the specific uh, APIs that Ross is uh, suggesting to change, but the fact that there is going to be a V2 yeah. uh, in the standard library. To me, it's a, I'm, I'm sure it's a big step. I'm sure it was a big point in their discussions. Because going up until now without a V2 sort of made the standard library look really good. And now, oh, you're using the previous method. It's sort of a, a really extreme example of this is Python 2, Python 3, right? It is a breaking mm-hmm. change in the standard tooling. Like a version is going to change and we're going to have two ways to do things. It's obviously needed, especially since you know we want to deprecate uh, top level seeding is Go 120. It's already deprecated. You shouldn't be using it. So, you know, breaking the API for that does make sense. But I don't know. There's something sad about it, about the adding a V2 to the standard library. It does feel like unfortunate clutter. Yeah. The good news is you won't have the same sort of problem you do with Python 2 and 3 that like they are incompatible with each other. By definition, the old API will always be there, at least in Go 1. Uh, so your old code will still work. You won't suddenly be hit with this. Oh, no, I have to upgrade now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a good thing. Although I, I assume that uh, after enough time, some linter is going to come out with like suggestions on how to move your uh, 
V1 math into V2. I'm sure that that's. So I have a question for you following yeah. up. This didn't happen yet, but I don't know. I, I have a tendency to believe that the discussions that Russ writes will happen. <laughs> <laughs> so assuming that this happens and uh, we get a V2 for math, mm-hmm. what's the next standard library that needs to get a big old V2 slapped all over it? Jason. Including uh, Jason. Why? It's terrible. Marshall and non Marshall. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh my God. There's already an experimental JSON 2 uh, repo that I've been following pretty closely. It's not getting a lot of attention, but I would love to see a new JSON Marshaller. Well, now that the, the floodgates are open, how about you open a discussion for that? There we go. Maybe I'll do it. Nice. <laughs> for me, it's not even a question, it's a text template. Okay. I love the underlying engine. The underlying mm-hmm. engine is great, but it's so difficult to just get it right the first time that mm. people end up using. Just uh, FMT, you know, Sprint F for super complicated templating, just because the original engine is not good enough. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, not the engine, the API. Yeah, uh, and also you have both HTML template and text template. Why mm-hmm. isn't it just template? Never mind. There are reasons, but we'll save those for another conversation. Uh, what I'm saying is, while this is a, a sad change, I think that now we might look at the other standard libraries perhaps more critically, and not mm-hmm. just as like gospel. This is how it should look. Right. Which, at least for me, is interesting. And talking about opinions that don't matter, want to talk about the Stack Overflow survey result? Yeah, so we mentioned that on the show uh, when, when they were asking us to do it. And I, I think we both filled it out and it was kind of an AI heavy survey. But, uh, my interpretation is that Stack Overflow is trying to figure out how they can best ad- take advantage of AI to boost their platform uh, from a marketing and, and you know, usability standpoint, which I suppose makes sense. But we're not an AI podcast, so let's not talk about that too much. Let's talk about the Go stuff. What did you find interesting in here about Go? So one thing that's important to note that is that both you and I didn't really enjoy filling out the survey when it came out, and we're not super enjoying the results now that we can see them. Not because we don't the results speak unfavorably of, of Go or anything like that, it's just they're laid out kind of weirdly and the questions were kind of weird. In general, it felt like Stack Overflow is, is using their old uh, favor to get us to fill in questions we don't want. But unsurprisingly, the most interesting questions for us is which programs people uh, like, which programming languages people uh, like, uh, which programming languages pay the bills, and whether Go is still a good language to learn. And the way they laid it out, it, it's kind of, it's not super easy to understand. Um, you have two numbers. You have desired and you have admired. And these two numbers should, according to them, sort of reflect how well the language is doing, how popular is it, or something like that. And there's another question which is a lot more straightforward, which is, like, what's the paycheck of someone using language X? Mm-hmm. Which to me was super weird. I don't know about you, but I've stopped tying my paycheck to a specific programming language, I don't know, about after two or three years in the industry. So, I don't know, this is kind of weird to me. Zig uh, pays, I don't know, 10% more than Go. Because the three people who are programming in Zig professionally happen to have good salaries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and Python is really low, you know, just because all the people who work in OpenAI are really, they're broke. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, what's his name? Sam Altman came on the stand. Uh, yeah, I'm just paying my, my bills. I'm not doing <laughs> anything more than with uh, OpenAI money. Sure, man. Uh, so the Go specific stuff we saw was that Go is uh, pretty well desired and, and very admired. Uh, it's up there in the top 10 uh, alongside in order JavaScript, Python, TypeScript, HTML, CSS, SQL, Rust, which obviously is super admired, C Sharp, Shell, Shell scripting, and then Go. In this list, I'm mostly surprised about C Sharp. I'm really happy to see it getting a resurgence lately. I think it's a good language. And again, Go is uh, topping the charts in top paying technologies as well, where you have Zig, Erlang, F Sharp, Ruby, Clojure, Elixir, Lisp, Scala, Perl, and Go, which at least for me says, uh, Zig, I don't know, I'm discounting that result. I don't think it's actually correct. I think it's uh, there's something uh, skewing the results there. But it's interesting to see how many languages here are JVM, but are not Java. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just ways to interact with the Java ecosystem. You know what I mean? Uh, and Go is like one of the top 10, which is, I don't know, at least interesting to see. Uh, here it's above Rust, unlike the admired and desired thing. There are more questions here, but honestly, I don't think you don't need to go to the survey results. They're very weird and hard to parse, at least in my opinion. I'm looking at this chart, the first one you mentioned about uh, the 
desired versus admired languages. And one of the things that jumps out at me is Raku. Are you familiar with Raku? Never even heard of it. Formerly called Pearl Sick. Oh my it's, God, it's bottom of the it's chart? It's desired by 0.33%. I think that's one person probably. Uh, and admired by 65%. Uh, you know, that's a huge spread. Uh, that kind of tells me people don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I, I don't. I don't really trust these results. Uh, for one thing, they're, as you said, they're presented in a very confusing way, so it's hard to really understand what they're trying to tell me in the first place. But some of these outliers are just too weird to to really put much weight into. One thing I I like always uh, remembering is seeing Lua on the top languages and, and mm-hmm. seeing people it does actually have its usages. But it's also weird to me to put Go and Bash in the same bucket and ask people, what do you think about it? it one thing that I do, I, I very much agree with the results, is obviously JavaScript is, uh, is the first one because, you know, web development, but it's not very well admired. It has one of the smallest spreads between the desired and admired of all the languages. The only one that might come close is MATLAB. So 17% spread versus... Yeah, it basically tied with MATLAB as far as that spread goes. And MATLAB is the lowest ranked. Oh, yeah, I see what you <laughs> see what you're saying. I think it's being the most used language for the part that people remember to do second is is what caused it to be that way, right? You have a project, you have yeah. an idea, you do the idea, especially in enterprise software, usually the idea is, involves more backend than user experience, right? In B2B. Oh, I will manage all your whatever. I will secure all your, your whatever for organizations. And then, okay, now we need to develop the front end. It's a pattern that repeats. It's, I don't know how, how it is in uh, Amsterdam, but especially in Israel, front end is almost always a second thought. You have a ton of senior backend mm-hmm. engineers here and almost no one is a, is a senior front end. I think this might explain the spread, uh, unlike Rust or Go, where the, it's uh, people look up to it and, yeah. and admire it. And they think, oh, it's, it's so good. It's so intelligent. It's so whatever to work in. It's so prestigious to work in back, <laughs> backend languages. But people don't see JavaScript that way. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that pattern per se, but I, I definitely think that there's a, a large segment of the population that uses JavaScript because they have to, because it's kind of the only option, uh, not because they choose to. With the back end, you can choose whatever you want. In the front end. That's not literally true. There are languages that transpile to, to JavaScript or, or whatever, but for the most part, you're kind of forced to use that. So you use yeah. it whether you like it or not. So these are the results, and I don't think you need to go any deeper. Moving on, one thing that's interesting from this week was the API protest and generally protest in user content generated communities. Yeah, it seems the internet's on strike. Yeah, the internet's on strike. <laughs> internet citizens unionize. Probably everybody heard about the Reddit API protest, but just in two seconds, uh, Reddit did an API pricing change sim- akin to what Twitter did, right? Yeah. Out of the blue, you have 30 days, here's the new API pricing. Um, and third party apps, which I'm, I use one. I use a boost for Reddit, not the official Reddit app. A lot of people who are on uh, iOS devices use Apollo. That was a pretty mm-hmm. big name. Uh, they obviously can't work with Reddit anymore. Uh, so people are really frustrated with Reddit because the official app is not so good. And also because, you know, these people built their livelihoods on the platform and then the platform is one-sidedly doing the change. And then they had an AMA about it on Reddit and it really didn't go well. The reason it relates to Go is because the Golang subreddit where the Jonathan and I collect our news also went on strike. And in a really funny twist, they didn't go on strike exactly on time. And someone asked, wait, why didn't we go offline for the protest? And then someone answers, we tried, but our SREs are just too good. <laughs> So Go is so good that even when you try to kill the process, you can't. Uh, but yeah, the protest is going on. The subreddit is, has gone dark. At least for me, it raised a lot of questions about using platforms for professional content, like about the language or, or something like that. And then you mentioned the other protest over at Stack Exchange. Yeah, the Stack Exchange Network has a moderator strike going on. The topic there is... AI-generated content. Uh, so if you may recall, when ChatGPT first exploded, Stack Overflow instituted a policy of no ChatGPT or AI-generated content. So if it was AI-generated, you could just moderators just delete it. They reversed course on that, and they now say that it is uh, allowed, and you cannot delete content solely for the reason that it's AI-generated. And a bunch of moderators don't like this. So they've gone on strike. Moderators are not moderating. 
many of them. I think 1,300 some have signed the open letter to Stack Overflow as of this recording and are not doing moderation work. So you may have a worse experience on Stack Overflow for a number of reasons now. You may have more AI generated answers and you may not have moderation happening. So when talking about Go, Go is spread over a few platforms. One of them is Reddit, which we're seeing right now being harmed from Reddit changes. Another is Stack Overflow, uh, where people, you know, the Go tag on Stack Overflow and is that has a ton of answers that people regard as the official documentation. Some people just use Stack Overflow as their documentation site. Uh, we have Slack, which can decide to kick. But you and I manage our community on the Go for Slack, right? If Slack decides to change pricing for, uh, you know, communities or limit the number of channels mm -hmm. or do some changes to uploading files or whatever, we're going to be harmed, specifically our show and obviously the Go community in general. Right. Not just because of our show, but, <laughs> but mainly, <laughs> mainly, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all our discussions and the code is happening on GitHub, right? Microsoft. Yeah. So I don't know. Go feels on one hand pretty well spread out, but it's not built for an apocalypse. If all the, you know, Google, Microsoft companies decide to start charging for using these platforms for open source project, Go is, is in a bit of an issue. Maybe because it has Google's backing, you know, they, they can feel more comfortable. We can feel more comfortable. But hey, Google just killed the DNS service. So who knows if even go.dev is going to work next month. Yeah. It brought back, you know, when working on open source was just via email chains and private servers and whatever. I don't think anyone wants to go back there, but I don't know. Maybe the economy is going to force us to. Follow us on Google+. Plus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk to us on Hangouts. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's the API protest. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I think that next week, uh, probably the subreddit is just going to go back to normal and Reddit's just going to become a lot worse. Uh, and what's the last point on this week's news? Let's end on something a little bit happier. So we saw a tweet this week from women who go Israel that they're getting their group back together. The band's back together. Yes. So you may recall we interviewed back in, in May, I think, we interviewed um, Adelina Sibion, author of the TDD book uh, that had just come out uh, for Go. And she's one of the organizers of the Women Who Go London. So it's good to see another one of these groups getting back together. I, I don't know if this is a post-COVID reunion, if, if they'd shut down and just hadn't gotten back together again, but they're back. So if you are a woman and you're in Israel and you go or would like to, then you should definitely go to the Women Who Go Israel group. And if you're a woman in any other part of the world, you should check out the other Women Who Go chapters. There are many of them. It's a great organization. And if you're not a woman, you can go to the one of the other meetups, I'm sure. But uh, special shout out to the women. And also, if you like cool swag, and obviously you already ordered everything from store.kapago.dev, uh, Women Who Go has really, really good swag. I have a two-year-old daughter. I bought a shirt with like a cute uh, gopher uh, father and daughter combo on it. And then I oh, bought nice. my daughter the same shirt with the same print. And it's really cute. So I highly recommend their swag. The shirt is extremely comfortable. And we don't usually do this, uh, but someone named uh, Yarden Life posted a new blog post on Medium. You can go check it out. It's about sync groups. It's mostly informational. If you want to learn about like weight groups and go sync, it's a good refresher. Uh, it's a really good post. Uh, the reason we mention it is because uh, the way I learned about the Women Who Go Israel uh, reopening is through her uh, tweets. So shout out to your dad for uh, pointing that out to us. And also she just uh, posted her first blog post ever. Uh, we hope to see uh, more in the future. Thanks for sharing your insights with the community so far. Always good to see new bloggers. I, I encourage all developers to blog. It's one of the best ways to, I think, boost your career, get some visibility. Uh, so kudos. Yeah, 100%. Actually, in my new job, nobody is blogging, and it's a 200-person R&D department. And at least internally, I didn't see any blog or newsletter or anything like that. I just decided on my first day to publish a blog post every day of like, this is my notebook, this is the things I did, this is the people I met. Awesome. A daily dev diary. And the responses I've gotten were just... Wow, you know, I come to introduce myself in a new company. We're like drinking coffee over lunch. I'm like, hi, I'm shy. I'm like, yeah, I read your blog. Oh my God, or whatever. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's, awesome. I, I already have my daily notes. It's not any extra effort for me, but uh, I've gotten awesome responses. I assume that's internal only, right, to your company? Of course. That's internal only. Uh, if you want to uh, read it, you can send me an email. I'll refer you to the company. You can join. I get a nice <laughs> referral, a nice big fat referral bonus. And then you can join. Uh, but uh, full disclosure, most of the R&D work in uh, Orca is done in Python. 
That sounds even more difficult than reading Medium articles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're about to the end of the news for the week. For the week and a half. We had to cut even more. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we're on Fridays now. Well, we have a great interview coming up. If uh, You may recall that uh, we talked about the Go developer survey, speaking of surveys, a few weeks ago. And desktop development for Go is one of the most popular areas of interest. So we interviewed somebody from the Fine Project. So if that's your area of interest, you won't want to miss this interview. It's a long one. It's going to make for a long episode today. But it's worth your time. So stick around for that. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you after the break. It's good that your jokes also return air. So I, I know how to handle them in both cases. <laughs> okay, uh, we can start the ad break with that. Welcome to our ad break, where we make fun of Jonathan's uh, sense of humor. Just don't panic if I tell a bad joke. Well, yeah. This episode is sponsored by Koyeb.com, our friends and partners who give you a serverless platform to deploy your apps globally. No ops, no servers, no infrastructure management, no nothing. If you listen to our uh, latest episode, you can check out just their CEO talking directly to your ears. Super, super down-to-earth technical guy. I feel really comfortable after talking with him Mm -hmm. to put my uh, servers there. Generally, you can run web apps, APIs, event-driven serverless functions, background workers, and even Chrome jobs on Koyab. And, uh, you know, as a user myself... I can highly recommend it. It's a great, great experience, super snappy. And they have a lot of interesting releases coming up. They're working really, really hard. So check out their latest new features. And if anything speaks to you, be sure to give it a try. It also has a free trial. So five bucks a month. Yeah, unlimited Uh, time. Like it's five bucks a month of credit forever. So it's like always free and that's enough to actually run some serious stuff. So. so so definitely go check it out. By the way, if you do check it out, I know I'm talking to you and I'm saying koyeb.com and you can type it out. Go through the link in the show notes because it has a referral thing. And they'll be like, oh, thank you, uh, Jonathan and Shai. You sent so many people our way, uh, which would be very cool for us. And thanks a lot, Koyeb, for sponsoring this episode. Um, what else? If you want to talk to us uh, about Koyeb or Go or anything else, you can reach us at kapago.dev. That's our site. Jonathan, you didn't register that on Google Domains by any chance. Right? No, I, I'm a GoDaddy user. I'm not a lover of GoDaddy, but I'm a user of GoDaddy. So, so don't worry, the domain is still going to work. Uh, Google's not going to kill it. If you want to talk to us, you can go there. Uh, from there, you can find all our links, such as our channel on the Gopher Slack, hashtag Kapago, that's kebab case with hyphens. And you can also email us, news at kapago.dev. That is news at kapago.dev. Uh, because this is our 20th episode, uh, we're holding a fun thing. We're on the Slack channel I just mentioned. We're going to try and name our gopher, the logo thing. Uh, yeah. So if you have a cool, fun name for our logo, the cute, like, go, you know, the coffee like, uh, chubby gopher yeah. with, uh, with the coffee and whatever uh, in the headphones. And by the way, the cookie crumbles on the desktop, which I didn't put in the prompt. And the AI just figured out for themselves, uh, which is apt. Uh, most of the, you know, most of the Go developers I've met accept cookies. They're just saying like that. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a competition to name it. And uh, the person who will name it will gain uh, fame forever. And maybe a sticker. We'll see. We have plenty of stickers to give away. So, yeah. And the stickers work great on laptops and bicycles and uh, just about anything, right? Yeah. I've, I've put one on my new work laptop to differentiate it from anyone, from uh-huh. everyone else. But I've actually been the one of the first people who got an M2. So a lot of people Ooh. are jealous of the laptop itself. <laughs> so we'll do the naming uh, competition and we'll come up with a name for the logo. Uh, if you have a fun name, uh, come share it in Slack. If you want to grab some swag with a cute logo on it and support the show, please go to store.kapago.dev. You can grab a cup. Uh, you can grab some stickers. You can grab a wireless charger, although no one has yet, and I don't blame them. It's a kind of a weird purchase, <laughs> but I just wanted to have three things yeah. on the shop. <laughs> and so far, people have been happy with the swag you can see in uh, in our Slack channel. So, so if you want it, come and if you want him, come and claim him. You know what we need for our third thing is is espresso cups. I don't know, or like a, a coffee espresso shot cup. I, I looked, I didn't see those in the catalog, but that would be nice. I'll talk to our supply. I know a guy. I'll talk to okay. our suppliers. We'll see if okay. we can make it happen. All right. Uh, and last thing, obviously, you're listening to this episode, uh, it, just as it came out, you know, you've been refreshing the RSS feed, wondering what's been going on. Uh, we moved to Fridays. Uh, I've started a full-time job, so uh, we're recording on Fridays now. The episode's going to come out on Friday, so you can listen to it, you know, to, to open up your weekend with some interesting stuff. Uh, send the links in Slack channel, you know, using a scheduled message for Monday, uh, <laughs> and, and be prepared for the upcoming week. Uh, so thank you, uh 
staying along for this change. All right. Well, stick around. Uh, we'll be talking to Andy Williams from Fine to learn how to build desktop apps in Go. Ooh, interesting. See you there. Hey, Jonathan, did you get a chance to check out the project I sent you? I did, and I already have complaints, but um, I'm trying to figure out how it works. This UI is funny. It's a UI thing. So, so like, it's this fixed width screen, and I have an ultra wide monitor, so it's this really, really wide screen. <laughs> <laughs> and it tells you Go News. Yeah, I see some Go News in here. Okay. Mostly on Reddit so far, which all of Reddit is about Reddit uh, canceling third party applications now, but still. It's a UI that works. So you're probably wondering, how much uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript did I write to get that running? Yeah, I'm guessing this probably took you a couple weeks. Yeah, so seven JavaScript frameworks. If mm -hmm. only there was someone here that could help us do it only in Go. That would be great. Oh, hey, Andy. Hi, guys. Hi. Glad to be here. Everyone, uh, say hi to Andy. Andy Williams is uh, one of the maintainers of the Fine project, F-Y-N-E. Jonathan and I reviewed the Go survey. Uh, when it, uh, the results came out a few weeks ago. And one of the things that caught us by surprise was how many people are interested in developing desktop applications in Go. I've never done desktop applications like ever. And it seemed like something that a lot of people are interested in, especially juniors. So we sort of looked around, we found fine. And here's Andy to tell us a bit more about it. But before that, Andy, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Shai. Uh, so uh, I have been, I guess, a software engineer uh, for oh goodness over over twenty years now. I'm based mostly in Edinburgh, up in Scotland, where I wish I could say the weather is lovely, but at least it's not cold right now. That's what we would call summer. <laughs> Um, I have been open source developer and somebody who works on graphics of different sorts for for many years as well. And uh, my my day job is. Uh, in startups and tech companies based here in Scotland for the most part. Um, and I had the opportunity to be a part of a really fast-growing mobile apps company a few years ago. Uh, when I left there, I realized that mobile had come a really long way and the tools were pretty slick, but the rest of the world just hadn't really uh, caught up. Uh, desktop particularly just seemed like a place that people didn't care about anymore. There was like this mm -hmm. assumption that the browser was the way to deliver all of your applications. And I was like, no, that that's not right. We've seen how things can be done really well with modern tooling. And I just wanted to see if we could apply that for apps that worked anywhere, which of course got me into Go because it's just the best way to, to compile for any platform. And so I just thought, right, okay, well, we're gonna see if we can build a really fresh toolkit with a, a new clean API, throwing away all of the painful legacy assumptions of graphical development across platform, which typically I think came from a C kind of backgrounds and what devices used to be, and target desktop and mobile and, and more in one go. And that's where the Find project came from. Uh, so I started that about five years ago and have been overwhelmed by the response from the community. Like the things that people can build quickly where their imagination goes, it really encourages the work that we're doing. And now we're we're really lucky to have a, a solid community around us. There's like between six and eight core developers who help maintain the project. We've had contributions from about 120 people. Um, wow. The, yeah, I know, right? The chat community as well, like across Slack, Discord, and Matrix, there's about 1,500 people on the channels. We just hit 20,000 stars on GitHub. And mm -hmm. I also read with interest the Go developer survey. We did, along with the Geo project, we did a follow-on survey about graphical apps. And we extrapolated that there's probably like 180,000 developers out there that have used fine to achieve something mm -hmm. and so this, it's kind of amazing you know what where this has come to in a relatively short period of time and i just want to see how far we can take it really you know there's there's definitely something here it's very exciting wow that's super cool um Thanks. in high level people can use fine if they want to build graphical applications not necessarily for desktop for any platform, right? Yeah, exactly. So you build you build a graphical application that's that's going to target any different device. I like to refer to it as platform agnostic app development because you don't care where it's going to run. The toolkit and the driver implementation is going to just do the right thing for your code on whatever platform the user is running on. 
And this is without any embedded web technologies. It's pure Go from a developer's point of view. And the compilers are doing all of the hard work and packaging it up for all of the different platforms. And the really nice thing about that is, even if you're not really building apps for desktop, you can use your desktop tools to build the apps no matter mm -hmm. what. So you can sit in GoLand or Visual Studio Code and build something for your mobile, or you could be pushing it out onto an edge device with an embedded touchscreen halfway across the world with a very low power chip. And it's, it's going to be the same tool setup that, you've, that you're using. So it's just a really nice way to build graphical software. What would you say Fine most directly competes with? And I, and I don't mean that to set up like an adversarial relationship, but just to anchor it in the mind of our listeners, if they already are familiar with, say, Electron or PhoneGap or, or what, I don't even know, that's an old school thing, but you know anything out there, what does it compare to that somebody looking at that thing might look at Fine instead? There are a few different answers to that question, I suppose, depending on where people are coming from. But I would say the most direct um, competitor or the most um, familiar mm -hmm. alternative in the space would be Flutter. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of people are familiar with the, the huge amount of work that Google has put into their attempt to build a new platform for graphical apps and mm -hmm. built on top of the Dart language. So it works for some people. The outcome, I think, is very, very similar. So we're on the face of it, targeting the same audience, but mm -hmm. they have taken a very different approach to development. So they've picked graphical tweaks, hot reload as being really important parts of their stack. And that's why the Dart language has fitted quite well for them. Uh, but the Fine project is based more on engineering principles and the idea of being very productive in development whilst creating a really good user experience at the end as well. So. We are more about unit testing and reproducible builds, optimized programming, rather than you know some of the more web-oriented tooling that is available in in other platforms. Good, good answer. And one thing that you know I found very interesting is I started uh, like I tried out fine before we brought you on the show. I started working on a small project. It's open source, by the way. If our listeners want to jump mm -hmm. on the fine bandwagon and also help help the show, uh, come uh, write some code. But it's just a small thing that should aggregate Go News and let us swipe left or right if we care about it or not and add it to the backlog of the show. And one thing that happened to me really fast compared to, you know, doing a web interface is that really, really fast, I had to start thinking about the application lifecycle and state. Just because Fine is in Go and you have to move data around and, you know, and refresh stuff, not in a, like a framework that hides everything for you and, and is very complex behind the scenes, I immediately started thinking about my app's lifecycle. Okay, so it gets up and it's loading. And then I want to bring a thing, so I need a channel. And then I want to wait until the user selects a thing, so I need another channel. And I immediately went to the logical representation of my app instead of the physical representation of my app, which is what I would do if I was doing web development and the framework would take care of everything, which for me was super interesting. I'm wondering how much the applications you've seen people develop are uh, complicated in their state versus how many of them look really, really good and slick and feel like is the focus more on functionality in UI apps or is the focus more on really, really beautiful UI apps? For me, after like three hours, the focus was totally on functionality. Yeah, I think it, it varies. It's actually really interesting to see the diversity of stuff that people create. And we, we try to make it as easy as possible to get started with something that's going to look good out of the box. And you know, good is subjective. It may not be something that, that everybody would consider as, as completely beautiful, but it's going to be usable and something that's straightforward and, and pleasing enough to, to use just straight out of the box. And I think because we've got that, you don't need to worry about either the style sheets or applying some theming information. People kind of go, all right, that, that's, that's good enough. Let me get into the nuts and bolts of building the application because the front end looks, looks okay already. And so Typically, we see folk getting into the the state of functionality um, right away, like like you said. And I, I think they don't all necessarily get into the complicated workflow side of things and how the life cycle is working. Um, more commonly, it's kind of like, oh, I can add this piece of functionality really quickly, and then I can chuck this in the side as well. And so it, it feels like you you're really really productive. You know, functionality is coming together quicker than than they might have experienced using um, a similar or platform specific graphical technologies before just because of the level of abstraction that we've got it's really easy to throw things together to, to get started 
And then as you get into specifics, like if you if you think, oh, I want my own style or the layout here that's standard is, is not quite what I was looking for, you get into the customization, putting your own brand onto it, which is a little bit more code, uh, but it's all definitely possible. So it's it's commonly the second thing that people look at is exactly how it's going to be presented. And if you go to the list of apps that people have open sourced based on find at apps.find.io in your browser, you'll see about 75 different applications currently there. Um, and there's a huge mix of people who've clearly gone 100% of functionality and others who have thought, actually, I want to think about how this is presented as a, a really important part of getting started as well. So just a big mix. Um, and interestingly, we've seen similar apps who have taken different paths. So there's like a media player that is very, very functional, but quite um, vanilla looking. And there's others where that's people a nice put way a lot to put of time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what my dates used to say about me. I'm vanilla. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but yeah, and, and so other people have taken a more graphical approach. But they, so what we want to make it possible is just for everybody to have something that's, that's looking good, good enough that the application is completely usable. Uh, but that a designer can come in and without knowing too much about how the application is put together, they can come up with a, a brand or a style guide or something like that. And then developers can code that into a theme and the theme will then automatically apply across the application. So you don't have to spend a long time editing every single widget or every screen of your application. Real quickly, um, what what platforms are supported by Fine right now? I mean, you mentioned mobile and desktop, obviously. Are there others? And, and which mobile platforms? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, on desktop, it is obviously you've got Mac, Windows, Linux, all the uh, basically all the different varieties of Linux across all the architectures. Um, and the same for Mac and Windows as well. You, you can do 32, 64 bit across Intel and um, ARM chips. We have BSD, I think FreeBSD, OpenBSD, um, fully supported NetBSD is kind of a work in progress. Across the mobile side, iOS and Android are fully supported and we're working on completing Linux mobile as well. So we've mm. got like a PinePhone and a Librem 5 in our test devices and they work pretty well already. In fact, when you compare the performance of a fine app against the, I think the GTK uh, implementation that they have in some of these devices, it's amazing how responsive it is without having optimized for that device already. And we have the web as a target as well. So you can run a fine app through the browser. And to do that, we compile to WebAssembly, but also we transpile to um, JavaScript through through Gopher.js because we find that some browsers perform much better with one or the other. So when you hit a fine Absolutely. app in a browser, it's going to do a runtime check and figure out which build to use. Uh, we don't publish that too much yet because really um, Gopher.js and some of the tooling isn't quite production enough for yeah. our liking, but it's definitely, it's there, it's in the release, and hopefully we'll take that to proper 100% production sometime soon. I'd love to hear where Gopher.js is not up to par for you. I don't doubt that because I'm one of the maintainers of Gopher.js and I just fixed a bug yesterday. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> but actually, honestly, it's not so much about functionality, but uh, the language compatibility. And yeah. so you need to have specific versions of the tooling installed. With the current release, we support Go back to 1.14 because it was important mm. to me and some of the community that we still support 32-bit iOS devices, oh, yeah. which we, we currently still do. But with the upcoming release of 2.4.0, we're going to switch up to go 1.17, I think, as our minimum requirement. So we're dropping the 32-bit iOS with the ability, of course, of having some new language features. And so that actually, I think, is currently what go for js is looking for. So that's kind of nice. But of yeah. course, people are using Go 120 and they'll be 121 right. by the time we hit this release. And so part of the reason we're holding back on go for js is because it's complicated to get the tooling set up exactly right. And we really do expect that folk can just get it running out of the box by simply having Go installed. Makes sense. So that's a, a bit of a challenge. It's probably the main thing holding mm -hmm. us back. Plus, there's a little bit more driver code that we need to write for the web which we haven't pushed forward on because we knew that the tooling was just needing a little refinement still. Yep. Uh, so actually a fine app running in the browser is currently limited to one window, but we'll get that addressed pretty soon. And hopefully for the next release, that'll be uh, awesome. there and fully supported. 
I guess the flip side of the question is, what isn't it supported on? Sounds yeah. like it can literally run on anything. Well, okay, I can tell you for sure. It doesn't um, actually, I can't tell you for sure. I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like if it has a screen, you can probably compile Go to it, right? Well, this is, this is exactly what we're trying to make possible. If there's a screen, you can build a fine app. Uh, now, the thing that I'm pretty sure won't work is Apple's virtual reality goggles that were announced last week. <laughs> or I don't know for certain because I don't know what the compatibility layer is like, but we don't have a pair to test with, so it's not going to work there, I don't think. If any, if any listeners want to donate a pair, yeah, oh, we yeah. have a I'm spare sure Apple that. Vision Pro lying around. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll happily accept that and work. Yeah, you'll, ta- you'll take that off their hands. <laughs> yeah. I should use the opportunity, though, to thank a number of people in our community who have literally donated hardware to the project because sometimes no you can't get things working without physically access to the hardware. Wow, that's and, awesome. Yeah, exactly. I don't really want to name drop on the podcast, but if you go to our sponsors page, you'll see information about lots of people who've helped out um, with a bit of cash or a bit of hardware. So that really makes a difference because we can then test um, all of the complicated corner cases for people I think also places it's not currently supporting that are requested of us would be the things like uh, Android Wear, other watch OSs. We don't really have support for those tiny, tiny screens and the architectures that they require to run. And smart TVs, we know that technically it can run on them, but we don't have the tooling set up to package for them. So we don't really call it supported. Um, one of the key things about the tooling that we have is that not only will it work, but that you can get the application bundled and shipped to a store with the tooling that we have. So when we call it supported, it means you could get an app into production on those devices into users' hands. So let's say I'm developing uh, my Mac application or my desktop application. What you're saying is that it's supported if I can get, for example, Jonathan to run it without like the Go tool chain on his machine, just with like, I don't know, brew install or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Although I would I would recommend not necessarily using brew install because the packaging for graphical apps encourages the more interactive install process, you know, the download and drag it into your apps folder. Yeah, but the drag it into your apps folder, every time I have to do it, I just feel like, you know, one of these experiments where... The animals have to <laughs> click on a thing to get the, the food pellet. They had yeah. to. There had to be a better way. I have to go to my mouse. I hate using my mouse. That's why I have Vimium on my Chrome, and I have Rectangle to manage Windows, and I have all the shortcuts. And when I was uh, studying programming, I did it in the army. In the army, they just for two weeks they took our mice. We wow. just didn't have them. They, they just confiscated them. And they were like, you have to do what you have to do without a mouse. And then every time an application forces me to use a mouse, it really annoys me. So I will take your recommendation because you're the fine <laughs> expert, but I will not take it happily. <laughs> well, no, it's perfectly fine to install it on the command line through Brew if it's packaged for Brew. Not, not a problem at all. Um, it's certainly going to work in, in that way. But yeah, so you're... Your fine based application could be packaged and shipped to any of these distribution mechanisms, whether it's through an app store or a package repository. It's all possible. You you know, for some of them, you're going to need to get a certificate for the target platform so that you can sign the code. Uh, but you oh, just yeah, feed sure. that into our build process. So, yeah, it's exactly the same code base for something that's installed locally or an iOS app that's made available on Apple's App Store or pushing something out to Google Play or Asteroids. It's definitely, yes, it's all packaged into the capability. One thing that's interesting when you start talking about the Apple Store, at least for me, it sounds like at that point, the fine project turns from a fun hobby side project kind of thing into something that people will, would actually use. Like I would build an application, I would sell it on the, let's say, macOS App Store for money. You mentioned a lot of the community and you mentioned a lot of the open source aspects. I'm wondering what's the end game of the fine project? Is it just going to stay an open source thing? Is there going to be a foundation? Is there going to be a company? Is there a commercial play uh, behind it? If I want to build my career based on fine, I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating a little bit, but... Uh, you know, if I want my my next two years to build uh, applications with Fine, is it a good idea to you know try to build commercial things on it? 
That is a brilliant idea. That is exactly what you should be doing. And a whole load of people listening to this podcast should be thinking about that as well. And you say that you're exaggerating, but honestly, you're not. I have spoken to people that call themselves fine developers, and that is their uh, their current job. That's, that's what they do. They use fine to build applications for their company. There are a lot of things around that are going to help make that possible. But I don't want to distract necessarily from the goal of the project because we don't want fine to become a freemium or a commercial entity or anything like that. There is documentation that we have to make sure that it retains a fully open source ambition. Everything that's part of the project will always be open source and fully available to everybody. So we're, we're using a, a BSD license, just like Go, to make sure that people can pick this code up and use it for any project in, in any context. And so that that's how the project works, the examples, the tutorials, all of it's always going to be fully open. I mean, we have very high standards to what gets into the library. There's a lot of work goes into how the API works together so that it's easy to learn, easy to maintain. Um, but for people who want to get started, there's also an extensions repository called FineX, where you can find things like a map widget, a, a date picker. People have added things like responsive layouts in there as well. So that's a, a, a way to get into it from a, you know, how, how can people um, extend it? From a commercial point of view, there are a few things going on. So, of course, we can have people support the projects through sponsorship. Now, some companies have done that, either donating hardware or donating money to, to make something happen. And we kind of have a something a bit like a bug bounty scheme as well. So if you sponsor at a certain level, you can get bug fixes accelerated or even features added, assuming that the toolkit team believe it's a good feature to be part of the ecosystem. If you're thinking about doing this in a commercial setting and you want to know that there's like help available when you need it, there is indeed a company. It's interesting you mentioned that. I find Labs, which is the commercial entity that makes sure that businesses get the support that they need. So we can set up support arrangements. We could do training, all sorts of things for, for your company. And we are working on some tooling that also helps businesses to get more out of fine. Uh, at the moment, the one that we have currently available is an automated deployment system. So as you might imagine, when you have a single code base application, that's great for the development process and testing locally. But when you want to get things out to users, there's still a lot of stores involved. There's a lot of packaging and a complicated process, which requires at least three different operating systems and hardware combinations to meet the main use cases. So we created a platform called Jeffrey that is going to help you automate that entire process. So we do the build and deploy. We can do self-update uh, infrastructure as well, and we'll help get your stuff out to store automatically through you know, webhooks and signing. So we're kind of solving the complicated business problems alongside the project, but we don't want to get in the way of the open source community as well. So we're, we're working hard to foster the open source, but to support businesses that are doing this commercially as well. So there are the main thing, fine, it's going to stay, or, or at least now you think it's going to stay open source. Uh, yeah. And the moment I become successful enough that I need help deploying to a million people on a million platforms, then I can uh, kick some bucks your way to, to make that happen. Yeah. I think that's a question that people might be thinking about this week more than usually just because of what the whole Reddit thing, right? People right. build their careers around building Reddit apps. And then the 30-day notice to change their API pricing and everybody loses their mind. So yeah, it's, really, it's... it's really good to hear that the core of the fine project is going to stay open source uh, because honestly, it looks like you can do a lot just with that. It's really, really important to us at the core that you can do anything that you want with the open source toolkit. Nothing that we do commercially wants to get in the way of that. So when you say, you know, the company side of things can help you with deployment, that's absolutely true. We will take care of things or automate things for you through our product. But if you had the time and effort or just didn't want to pay for anything or use proprietary software, you can do it all with the tools available in the open source project. So it, it's just so important that we don't get in the way of what people can do in the open, but we want to make it easier for businesses to move faster if they see that there's a good commercial arrangement to be had, I suppose. One question I hear, I'm not really in the you know the visual app development space. I'm more of a back-end engineer, but I do keep my ear to the, to the ground sometimes, and I've worked with front-end in, in you know, iOS developers and so on. And one debate I often hear come up is the question of, should we build native apps per 
platform, or should we do something like Fine or Flutter or or Electron or whatever to you know build a or React Native to build a single app that we can deploy on multiple platforms? And there's a couple different concerns that come up there, and I want to ask you about two of them at least, and any others that you're aware of. The obvious one is performance. Um, are these apps going to perform as well? if we build one app to deploy multiple places. And the second one is the look and feel and sort of the skin and that sort of stuff. How does Fine answer those two questions? Yeah, they are common questions that are asked. So, well, well, nice one for picking them up. The performance side of things is quite quite easy to answer. We are building apps that compile down to native code. That's absolutely a, a core part of what we do. So when I say that we're doing um, platform agnostic native applications. That means that you down on the tin, you get native performance. We're wiring into the hardware accelerated graphics. So these should be competing with native built specifically for the platform apps. Mm-hmm. Now, I can't promise that it's one-to-one because there's optimizations that we should be doing internally and it's always getting better, but it's comparable to that level. You're not going through runtimes, virtual machines, just in time, anything. It's mm-hmm. absolutely built there for the device. So by the time it's on your on your device, you know it, everything is set to go with high performance. Uh, we've done some uh, benchmarking on devices and it is actually surprisingly fast. Like even knowing that we're going through OpenGL uh, and, and aiming for this performance, it could be really pleasing to see what is possible. Mm-hmm. So from a performance point of view, it, it should be there. If you happen to be building a fine app and you find that something is a little bit slow or you're not, you were expecting more, open an issue. Like we'll get to the bottom of it and make sure that's improved. Nice. Uh, so we've seen some issues like that. I, I know that the variance on graphics drivers on the hardware level mean that sometimes we need to add an optimization or, or tweak something for a particular device. But we, we're happy to do that because we want that to be their solid performance across the board. Mm-hmm. The look side of things is kind of a harder one. It's a little bit subjective, or you either like what you're what we're doing, or you don't. Um, and so this can go backwards and forwards with people. We started based on material design. It was a pretty standard look, really well documented, open standard for how applications can um, be expected to behave or um, set themselves up. And of course, that was built by Google with Android in mind. But it's vaguely reminiscent of Windows 10 and 11 also. And of course, a lot of web has been built this way. So people don't typically feel offended by the the design aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So we thought that was a really solid place to get started. But as it was designed for Android in the first place, it is quite mobile heavy. So we've made adaptations where we think appropriate so it kind of maps more smoothly onto desktop and web as well. So we kind of made a more platform agnostic version of it. And we have our designer in-house who will, before each release, add a little bit more polish to it, a bit of finesse. So our color scheme was refined last year and the next release this year, we're adding corner radius to a lot of things just to, to overall smooth the aesthetic. The promise that we have as part of our design is that the application is going to look the same, just like we promise it's going to behave the same on any device. So that to us is really important because it means consistency. You can test the graphics, the rendering, and know that it's going to work the same everywhere. There's far less to do on each device that you want to test on. For some people, that's not what they want because they would prefer something that blends in specifically with each operating system. And I know that toolkits have done that in the past. Java Swing, I think, is a really good example of a native-like look, but they never got it quite right And they're always chasing the tail because, of course, every operating system update, the provider tries to tweak it a little bit in the way that we try to tweak our UI. Mm -hmm. And so you end up chasing the latest um, alterations for each platform. And you have to do an awful lot of OS integrations to understand exactly the user preference on that version of the operating system. And then you get huge variants which if it was just literally the graphics, the the colors or the pixels, it would probably be okay, but it includes sizing and layout and orientation changes and the combinatorial explosion of things that you would have to juggle at that point are are too difficult, not from a coding point of view, but from um, a testing validation. Uh, I think we would just lose our minds to trying to make sure that always worked. So instead a visual consistency means that we can assure people it's going to work the same on absolutely everything and there's not too much to worry about. Nice. 
if I'm coming into fine from go, I think it's pretty easy to get started. Like I'm, uh, for me, I'm, I never built a UI app before, but I, y- you use them because that's how we use uh, computers and, and phones. So it's easy for me to grasp like the main concepts uh, and get started and get something up and running because I know Go. Yeah. One thing that I thought about while uh, developing my app was actually about styling. You mentioned the theme and whatever. Oh, I wonder where I'm going to put my CSS file. And then I imagined a web developer sick of their slow, you know, 500 megabyte uh, Electron app that just really wants something fast that looks good, that's sleek. Or you talked about uh, running on an edge machine. I'm imagining a fine app running on like a control screen for like some SCADA controller in a, in a factory. It's not exactly where you want to be running Electron. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> and I'm wondering... People who came into Fine from web development or from other frameworks, like uh, you mentioned, do you? They have a, a different onboarding experience. Is it a harder for backend developers to learn Fine, or is it harder for other, you know, people who know other uh, application development frameworks to get into Fine? Yeah. So we have a lot of these conversations with people who come into the channel and chat about their experience. And a lot of people are apologetic about it, actually. They feel like they should have automatically got it because it looks like it's so simple. And I, I say, no, no, like share your experiences because we want to make sure it's easy for everybody. So if you're finding it's not easy, we want to learn why and how we can improve it. From this experience, we found that people who've never built graphical apps before get up and running really fast because they read the documentation, they understand how it works, and they kind of play with it. So backend developers especially go, like you say, pick this up pretty well. They're up and running, no bother at all. Also, people who have used lots of different toolkits can pick it up quite well because they've seen many different ways to do things and they understand the concepts behind it so they can kind of find the API that they're looking for, see how it adapts, and they've got some relearning or, or learning to do, but they kind of pull it together, no bother. Honestly, the, the group I think that are struggling sometimes to get up and running that fast are either people highly experienced in web development or specialized in a single toolkit that they have used, you know, for the last 10 years. So if you're a Swing developer or uh, Objective-C and you're coming from a, a Swift UI or something like that, you're going to look at what we have and go, that's not how UIs work. And so fundamentally, these people have to relearn some of the things because fine is different. We have taken a fresh look at how these things should be done. And in many situations, we've got APIs that just don't make sense to people who believed um, previous design aesthetic for the API. And so that can be a little bit challenging. Um, But to paraphrase a few of the community from our um, support channels, forget what you know and learn how fine wants to do things. Don't fight it because you will waste your time. But once you've learned it, you will be so productive, you will wonder how you ever built something in a different way. That's a strong promise. You just reignited my, I really want to open the fine project that I'm working on and and start hacking away to get there. (laughs) Then I'm doing my job well. (laughs) If people want to get inspired in the same way or talk to you or the rest of the fine team, how can they reach uh, you and how can they reach the community? Yeah, so, I mean, to get involved in the project, there's obviously our website at find.io. The developer documentation is at developer.find.io, although it's all linked together through the navigation. That's where the majority of our docs are. Is the site built with Find, by the way? Now that I'm thinking about it. Not yet. (laughs) Not yet. Because, so in this situation, it could be, but I think presenting documentation is what the web was built for. And graphical native application has other, you know, targets. We do have embedded aspects where you can run the fine app inside the documentation. That's pretty good because it gives you the opportunity to try it out. But a documentation site, it really fits better with the the presentation layer that the HTML CSS offers. So I don't think we're going to rewrite the whole thing soon. So the end game for fine is not to rewrite the entire web in, uh, in... Not at all. No, applications and web delivery in my head are separate. The usage of a browser blurs the edges, mm-hmm. um, but we're not trying to change how people consume documents. That's, that's a, you know, the web has a really good use case there. It's what it was built for. Um, but the, anyway, yeah, so the, the documentation is out there. We have a YouTube channel if people prefer video consumption. Uh, and there are various events that you might find us at as well listed on the website. However, I think a, a lot of the first usage people find good conversation in the chat channels that we're on 
So you can find us in the Find channel on Go for Slack. Yeah, it's furious. People are typing there all the day. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. The last few weeks have actually been um, quite busy. It's great to see a lot of a lot of people coming on and actually sharing the applications they're building, which is it's always amazing to see. There's a Discord where we are in the Gophers Discord in the Fine channel, but we also have our own guild server uh, in Discord, which you can find either linked from that channel or from our website. And if you prefer Matrix, there is a um, a Fine channel at matrix.org. Is it matrix.org? Anyway, there's, the, there's a Fine channel that you can find on Matrix. And how can people reach out to, to you specifically? Yeah, so they well they can find my um, details and rantings at my my website or blog. That's Andy XYZ in your browser. Yeah, we'll also link that in the show notes, uh, so people can find you on your site. That's a pretty cool domain, Andy XYZ. Thanks. I yeah, I, I picked up a little while ago. I just wanted something short, and also it makes for a good handle. So people like they ask why I've got such a weird handle. Uh, on all the chat servers is because well, it's a domain name. It is where you can find me. So I don't need to explain, you know, what my name is here or here or here. So generally, if you see Andy XYZ on Gophers somewhere, that's me. Uh, if you want to reach out on any of those servers, I hover on all of our community channels. Also, you can reach out on email. It's Andy at the domain name. I think that's, that's probably the main way. But honestly, just come into one of the community channels, chat about what you're doing. I would love to find out more. If you've got feedback or questions equally, it's just great to engage with the community. Yeah, honestly, that's how we got connected. I just went into the Find channel. I was like, hey, I'm trying to build this thing. Help me. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. It wasn't that desperate. I think it was- Did you get the Stack Overflow reaction of downvotes and and, uh, and shunning? Oh my God. I'm so happy (laughs) it's not the vibe in the go for Slack. There are some channels. I'm not going to name any GoKit names, but there are some channels where <laughs> if you ask for help or you ask anything, you just get you, you get shunned. Wow. I've been so happy with the Go community. It is one of the best things, I think, about using Go for a project of this size is that people are welcoming and supportive and they take the time to understand. And you never need to apologize for having a question or not understanding something. People are willing to, to help you out. The one, the one thing I think is important, though, if you're coming to the community channel... Um, and you're wanting to discuss a problem that you're having, bear in mind that you're probably going to need to learn something as well. There's not a whole bunch of people sitting there waiting to write the code that you need for your application. We'll point you in the right direction. There's good documentation. There's examples. There's so many apps out there now that we can usually point at somebody who's implemented something equivalent. Um, But it's important to understand how the code is working, how how it fits into your use case as well. Because if, if you just expect people to... Uh, fill in the blanks for your project, you're going to keep coming back and, and not really understanding it. And we want to make sure that people both have the answers, but also know why it works. Because with a, a carefully crafted API, like Go, like Fine, it follows logically. And once you've understood the structure, everything should should come naturally. Well, we've we've gone a little bit long, but I think it's okay. This was, as we discussed earlier, a really hot topic on the Go developer uh, survey. So I think it'll be interesting to a lot of people. I also imagine you are in a fairly unique position to answer our standard questions because you work in a corner of the Go community that many of us have not yet worked in. Um, so the standard questions, the first one is, you're forced to remove something from Go. What would it be? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a number of things that I'm sure are standard answers uh, in this regard. Uh, but mostly I love the language. I think it's been very, very carefully put together and thought out. I'm going to say something that may or may not be controversial. I would actually just take back out the recently added generics. Yes. And this is not because I hate them. <laughs> it's I just don't think that they were necessary at all. <laughs> and the reason I think it would, or if it was me, I would take it out, is because people come to us and they go, now that there's generics, why don't you rewrite your API? Uh-huh. And I'm like, well... We've currently got no need for generics, so why would we all make breaking changes to our API to accommodate something that's new? Now, once we're using a Go version that's new enough to be able to make use of them, internally, I think there's probably usage for it, but I don't see the need for it proliferating across an API. We do have a data binding package that helps people to avoid a bit of boilerplate code. So, you know, if, if a, um, a data field in your source changes, it should replicate across into the user interface. And we have a bit of generated code in there. And maybe generics would make it ever so sli- ever so slightly simpler. Mm-hmm. But I don't see that it's fundamentally going to make a big difference to what's possible. And I think without it, 
it's much more readable and your IDE can do a better job of suggesting the right function calls without generics in there. So I don't see the need for it and I would happily not have to discuss it ever again. <laughs> Incidentally, if we didn't have generics, we would be on Go4JS 1.20 by now also. That's been the holdup for go for js i thought that <laughs> might be yeah yeah oh dear <laughs> okay just to provide for balanced uh you know uh journalism i think uh, generics are great okay <laughs> i don't i don't i don't i'm not sure i even actually we'll, believe it i just we'll, have we'll to fight give this the other out, side. we'll fight this out off the air <laughs> yeah um on the flip side the other uh standard question uh is what feature would you add to go what would you pick up from somewhere else in the tech landscape and add to uh the go landscape this is a really difficult question to answer because at no point during my Go development over the last five years have I thought, wow, it really lacks this thing. I'm stuck because it's not included. And people are surprised by that. Like you say, when you're doing graphics, there must be a huge gap in the language because there's things that aren't part of it. But actually, we've been surprised. There's a fair number of graphics prim primitives baked into the standard library. You can, you've got image manipulation, you've got the, the, the loading of many standard formats, and you've got uh, painting to pixels, you can do a bunch of manipulations. So it's not really lacking anything substantial in my opinion. The, the two libraries that I use regularly that might just hint at something um, that it would be good to add are, I like a richer test API. The fact that unit testing is baked in is it fundamental and hugely important. But whether it is um, whether it's the testify package or whether it's the replacement is, I think is the new mm -hmm. the newer one. I think it'd be really good to have assertions in general, that kind of API in test because it just makes the tests more succinct, which is great because I love code that does only. Um, what it says, and and as you know, uh, not not as few characters, but as few different words as possible in a line to communicate that. And I think they do really well. We had a Daniel Neffen on the show, one of our first interviews, I think, uh, who's the maintainer oh, of right. uh, a similar package, not the Testify, but the Go Go Test Tools, which does uh, similar things. And he shared the same sentiment. But I think that the trade off between keeping the language very lean and giving these quality of life features. Um, yeah. It's a very different balance to maintain. I don't think it's obvious that it we need to add Testify to the standard library. No, and also the way that Go interacts with public repositories just makes it so easy that it's really tough to get passionate about something that's missing because it, it's there and you can use it right away. Um, I have a similar feeling about some slightly more advanced image manipulation. So resizing of images and rotating of images. It would be great if that was part of the standard image package. I understand why it's not, because it gets very complicated very fast, especially if you want high performance. Mm -hmm. But without them, we would have a few less dependencies in the fine package overall. So that would be quite nice. But of course, realistically, the thing that Go is missing is fine. Wow. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's a first. Look forward to import fine, and that's it. You know, no domain name, just put it in the center library. <laughs> Yeah, I say that partly as a joke because I don't think that a project like this works really in the core language. Yeah. But it would be it would be great to entertain a discussion about whether it could be or any tool like Fine could be considered as recommended alongside the language mm. because Go has grown up in a systems place. It was what it's created for, and it's what it excels at. Um, but it, anything that we can do to dispel the idea that you can't or shouldn't build apps with Go. Is going to be helpful because we've demonstrated what hugely, what massive benefits is is possible with the language and with the tools that we've built up around it. I would just love for people to believe it's it's part of what is um, encouraged or possible, um, and in part alongside that, the idea that a graphics track could be in Go conferences would really change my life because it is tough to go to a conference and speak to people about your passion. You know, mine, mine being graphics. You have to hunt down folk and they're there. You know, they attend, they're interested as well, but you can't go to a session and talk about graphics or graphical apps because it's just not included in the focus, I suppose, of a Go conference to date. So that kind of is, is why I would like to 
have a conversation about it raising its profile in general. I think that it is possible to imagine Find being a recommended tool or at least a, a, the standard tool in the same way that, you know, nobody's thinking today how they should do Go linting, right? It's Golang CI Lint. No question. Even though that yeah. Golang CI Lint is not part of the Go tools, you have Go Vet and you have Go Format, which is the standard tooling. But I think it's almost obvious that you use Golang CI Lint. Like I mm -hmm. never start a new project without it. And it's so easy to mm -hmm. get started. I just copy the configuration from my latest project and, and run the thing. <laughs> um, I think that if you want linting, you want Golang CI Lint, it's possible in the future that if you want uh, UI, you, you go get fine. That would be that would be really cool. That'd be really awesome. Cool. cool. So before we close out, what does the future hold for Fine? Looking uh, forward, we talked about the commercial side. We talked about open source. We talked about making it maybe part of the standard library, but that's a <laughs> pipe dream. What's in the future of the project? You know, in the immediate. Future? Yeah. So I I think we've we've covered so many of the things about what we're working on, what's important to the project. But really, what I want to see is just to be able to make it easier for more people to build the application of their dreams to reduce the barrier to entry even further. Go has done such a tremendous job of making it easy for people to get into building really solid software that does amazing things. And I would love to see us being able to do the same for graphical applications for people across the board. The chance that we've, we've taken to reinvent some of this stuff to make it easy from the outset by removing legacy concepts and jumping on board Go's best practices, I think makes it easier than ever to build these applications. And so I, I want to just jump right on this bandwagon, if you will, and, and help more people get into it. It is not difficult. It doesn't require any tremendous amount of background experience or anything like that. And with a community like goes around you, everybody can build the thing that they have in their minds. And yeah, I just want to see more and more of that um, and share the word wider. I think that Go can help a lot of people. And I think that fine as part of that needs to be uh, sent out further. And I'd be quite excited, I think, to see it being used in a curriculum of some sort, uh, whether it's in like a, um, a, a text upskilling place or a university or kind of late in school where people can actually build real applications. They get it onto their device. Like on day one, they've built something, they had it in their head, it's on their screen, and then it's on their phone. It's amazing what you can do with, with this tooling. And I, yeah, I want to help expand that and get more people excited by it. Well, I think that what you told us about Fine so far would definitely get some of our listeners really excited about Fine. I'm definitely super hyped to go back and hack at it. Suddenly from building a small you know, UI application for Jonathan and I to play around with, it became, oh, I'm going to build the applications of the future <laughs> and whatever. It's fantastic. I, I look forward to meeting a whole bunch of the people who listen on, on our Slack, uh, on, on one of our chat channels. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see what's possible and little applications uh, aren't inspiring you, if you're a Linux user or a BSD user, we actually do have a full desktop environment built with Fine called Fine Desk. And there's a login manager called Finn. There's a whole bunch of stuff out here that's possible. Wow. But some of our team literally use um, a desktop where everything top to bottom, everything on screen is Fine based. And it's, it's kind of incredible to think that that is possible at such an early stage of a project. Awesome. Well, as uh, we didn't mention it yet, but Jonathan uses Linux. So maybe he can try it out. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thank you so much. It's been really great to chat it's through. Been quite, um, a appreciate the... chat. quite a fine chat. Quite a fine chat. Well, I think you're going to have to refine that joke. Uh, I don't know. I think it's going down from <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Uh, so Andy's not here anymore. Um, it was super nice. You know, we got on their Slack. Their Slack is one of the most uh, active channels on the Gopher Slack. And we were like, hey, I have a fine thing I want to do. Then uh, he answered. It was super nice. And we could set up the interview really fast. Dude is eloquent. <laughs> Knows how to interview. Yeah. I wish I had. Also, the British accent has the sophistication. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So super interesting interview. Thanks, Andy. He and I stayed on for another 15 minutes after you left, and I picked his brain about a few things uh, as well. He's a really great guy, um, clearly interested in being hel honestly helpful. So I think it's a great, it sounds like the fine community is a great community, a fine community, if you will, uh, uh, to join. <laughs> uh, if you want to join it, go check With out Fine. With names like go and find, the puns never end. Yeah, yeah. If you want to join after you heard uh, Andy and build your next desktop app using Go, 
uh, go check out fine.io. Uh, it's also in the show notes, obviously. You can follow Andy on social media. All the links are in the show notes. But his handle generally is andy.xyz. So wherever you are. Thanks a lot, Andy. It's been if super fun. you made it this far of the episode, you. we really appreciate you listening. It's been a long one. We'll see you yeah. next week. Or we're on in the background and <laughs> you know, yeah. you're not even noticing it. Thanks a lot, everyone. We'll see you Friday next week.